Have you ever wondered who the Scot in Scot Free is? Well, want to know more. It's commonly stated that the Scot here was a man named Dred Scott, famed for being involved in one of the most pivotal court cases in US history. And really, in the dude called Dred Scott, the part of his name we remember is the Scot, not Dred. Ah, <laughs> uh, this, he got off Dred Free. <laughs> This was the mid-19th century case Dred Scott vs. Sanford, which decided if Scott and his family should be free or not. More on this in the bonus facts in a bit. However, it turns out that this isn't correct. In truth, the phrase actually dates all the way back to at least the 11th century. The Scott in this case is from the Old Norse word Scott with a K, though, meaning something to the effect of payment or contribution. In English, Scott initially just meant tax. <laughs> Gotta pay my Scots. The phrase Scott free was first used in reference to municipal tax levies. Each person in a town would be obliged to pay a share of the Scot, the tax, which was called their lot. In some areas, you also were not allowed to vote unless you paid your lot of the Scot. Those who didn't pay, such as the poor or those wealthy individuals that could get out of it, because that seemingly been a thing forever, were then Scot-free. Thus, initially, the term more or less just implied that you got out of paying your taxes. It quickly spread to being used whenever someone got out of paying anything that they should have, monetarily speaking. Today, it is also used in reference to non-monetary forms of payment, such as someone who commits a crime but then gets off scot-free without ever being punished for said crime. Okay, so one of the earliest known references to the phrase comes from the Charter of 1066, where it states, Scot-free and Gawler-free on Shire and on Hundredy? <laughs> Maybe, but it basically means Scot-free and Tribute divide lots by subdivisions within a country. There you go. Moving on, have you ever wondered who the J in jaywalking is? Turns out, once again, this wasn't a person. Or more precisely, it wasn't a specific person, more or less referring to a group of people. Country bumpkins, rednecks, or hicks. More specifically, it comes from the fact that J used to be a generic term for someone who was an idiot, dull, rube, unsophisticated, poor, or simpleton. Thus, to jaywalk, <laughs> gotta bring back a rube, you're such a rube. <laughs> Thus, to jaywalk was to be stupid by crossing the street in an unsafe place or way, or more aptly, a country person visiting the city who wasn't used to the rules of the road, or more aptly, a country person visiting the city who wasn't used to the rules of the road for pedestrians in an urban environment, or just a Brit visiting America. So these people would just attempt to cross the street anywhere. As stated in the January 25th, 1937 New York Times, in many streets, like Oxford Street for instance, the jaywalker wanders complacently in the very middle of the roadway as if it were a country lane. Although the Oxford English Dictionary states that the first known use of the term jaywalking and jaywalker was in the June 1917 edition of Harper's Magazine, which states, the Bostonian has reduced a pedestrian who crosses the street in disregard of traffic signals to the compact jaywalker. But in fact, the actual first known reference that we could find was from a 1909 Chicago Tribune, where it stated, chauffeurs assert with some bitterness that their joyriding would harm nobody if there was not so much jaywalking. The term was also mentioned in a 1915 New York Times article where they stated they found the term jaywalking highly shocking and truly opprobrious. That's shameful. This was in reference to the way it was used at the time akin to a racial slur, but in this case, more of a pejorative class term. Specifically, it was a derogatory term against poor people by people who were wealthy enough to drive. Automobile-related, those fancy, fancy people. Automobile-related companies popularly used this term in various anti-pedestrian campaigns. <laughs> anti-pedestrian campaign, okay. For instance, John Hurt's president of Yellow Cab even went so far as to say, we fear the jaywalker worse than the anarchist. And Chicago is his native home. Chicago is still noted today for rampant jaywalking among the populace. Oh no. In order to counter the automobile interests who were trying to get pedestrians off the road, for a time the term J-drivers was used as a derogatory term for people who drive cars in such a way as to hog the road or pose a danger to pedestrians. We could bring that back. This obviously didn't catch on, and in the end the automobile companies won the fight for use of the roads. Next up. Quitting cold turkey. For those unfamiliar, when you quit something cold turkey, who's unfamiliar with this? <laughs> it means that you're quitting smoking, drinking a hard drug, or eating delicious chocolate cake right then and there without being slowly weaned off the addictive and possibly chocolatey substance. 
my favorites, chocolate cocaine. So, where did this come from? Cold turkey actually started off meaning plain speaking, a meaning that is still around today, though it's much less prominent with this definition, usually in the form of talking turkey when it's used today and it's only said by your grandparents or maybe your great great grandparents. The phrase cold turkey first appeared in print in 1914 in the Des Moines Daily News, which stated, I've heard Reverend Billy Sunday give his booze sermon, and believe me, that rascal can make tears flow out of a stone. And furthermore, he talks cold turkey. You know what I mean? Calls a spade a spade. Exactly how turkeys are related to plain speaking is unknown, but the leading hypothesis is that a plate of cold turkey is a simple meal without many frills. That is, it was pretty plain. Therefore, talking cold turkey meant talking plainly. That said, there isn't a lot of direct evidence to back up this hypothesis, it's just the best thing that etymologists have come up with. As for the abruptly stopping a bad habit definition, one of the earliest references of this can be found in a 1921 Canadian newspaper, The Daily Colonist. Perhaps the most pitiful figures who have appeared before Dr. Carlton Simon are those who voluntarily surrender themselves. When they go before him, they, drug addicts, are given what is called the cold turkey treatment. As for the jump from plain talking to quitting drugs, this once again is thought to be centered around the simple explanation. If talking turkey means talking plainly, then quitting cold turkey means quitting plainly without any frills or fancy methods like, you know, medicine. Whatever the case, back in the 1920s, this phrase in context was mostly only used to refer to people quitting some drug. However, over time, it has evolved to mean quitting anything. And on that note, not quitting coffee, it is the life force. Moving on from there, dead ringer, meaning a perfect imitation of something, like today I found out being a perfect imitation of Vsauce. While it is commonly stated this is somehow connected to people being buried and having a bell at the surface that they could ring to let someone know they were still alive, the problems of the past, this has nothing to do with the origin of the term. Instead, actual documented evidence points to a different story entirely, and that one involves horse racing. In the 1800s, a ringer was a stand in for a horse at a race. Sometimes people would clandestinely replace a slower horse with a faster horse or vice versa for later betting purposes. Of course, the horses had to look extremely similar in order for this con to be pulled off. In 1882, an article published in the Manitoba Free Press described this. A horse that is taken through the country and trotted under a false name and pedigree is called a ringer. The word ringer started out as a word for someone who rang bells, such as the bells in a church. The jump from ringing bells to switching out horses probably seems like a bit of a big one. It does, but in the early 1600s, another phrase appeared that helps sort all of this out. That phrase is ring the changes, today meaning to do something in a different way in order to make it more interesting. Originally, this simply meant that the bell ringer was ringing a pattern of bells that included all variations and eventually brought the ring back to its starting point. However, a variation of ring the changes cropped up by the 18th and 19th centuries, which meant substitute counterfeit money for good. From there, it's easy to see why the term ringer would be applied to a horse that was secretly substituted for another in horse racing. The horse ringers obviously were not dead, though, or they wouldn't be able to race. That's pretty damn clear. In this case, the word dead is used to mean exact or precise, as with many other phrases that use the words such as dead center. This meaning has been around since the 16th century, though exactly how the words meaning morphed from actual death to exact isn't really known. Dead was added to Ringer soon after Ringer started to be applied to horses. The first known published case of dead Ringer appears in the Oshkosh Weekly Times in June of 1888. It reads, Datar is a markable semblance bichu? Said Hart, looking critically at the picture. That's a dead ringer to me. I never seen. I never done such a resemblance. I never done such a semblance. Okie dokie. <laughs> Bonus fact. For those not familiar with the Dred Scott case, Dred Scott was a slave born in Virginia somewhere between 1795 and 1799 who ultimately played a large role in accelerating the start of the U.S. Civil War and indirectly helped popularize the Republican Party. Scott originally was owned by the Peter Blow family, but was sold to Dr. John Emerson, who moved around a lot due to being a doctor in the U.S. Army. During this time, Dred Scott found himself living briefly in Illinois, a free state since the Wisconsin Territory in present-day Minnesota, where slavery was outlawed. 
As such, at around 47 to 51 years old, even though he was at the time living in non-free territory, he petitioned for his freedom on the grounds that when he was in those free territories, he should have been automatically free, both by state laws and by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. He filed suit initially on April 6, 1846, with the courts to have himself and his wife and two daughters freed. Why he waited so long to do so isn't known. It is speculated that he didn't know of the law at the time, so didn't bring the matter up while living in those free regions. The first suit was dismissed due to insufficient evidence, but the court allowed Scott to refile. During the second trial, the jury ruled in the Scott family's favor and proclaimed them free due to the fact that Dr. Emerson had illegally held him as a slave while Scott lived in those free regions. However, this decision was appealed and the Missouri State Supreme Court ruled against the Scots in 1852. This was particularly significant because it overturned the firmly established once free, always free precedent, with Scott and his family having been free during the interim of the jury's ruling and the state Supreme Court's ruling. After another failed suit, the case was brought before the U.S. Supreme Court in Dred Scott v. Sanford. Note here that the court misspelled Sanford as Sandford. They ruled against him 7-2, stating that because of his race and original status of slave, he had no rights as a citizen of the U.S. and thus could not file suit against anyone in a U.S. court. That is a true up system. <laughs> this was in contrary to common practice in free states where many allowed free slaves to become citizens. As such, because the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land, it effectively nullified those people's citizenships. Their ruling also overturned the Missouri Compromise as unconstitutional because it would allow slave owners to be deprived of their property slaves without any sort of due process. If the slave owners traveled through or moved to a territory where slavery was outlawed, which violated the Fifth Amendment. Needless to say, the Supreme Court Court's ruling outraged abolitionists who had recently formed the Republican Party three years before in 1854, with one of their primary goals being to stop the spread of slavery. The ruling became hotly debated throughout the country, polarizing many individuals on the issue of slavery and ultimately bolstering the new Republican Party's numbers. This helped eventually to get Abraham Lincoln elected as president in 1860, the first Republican U.S. president. After the ruling, the Scots were given back to the Blow family who had originally owned them. The Blows subsequently grew granted them their freedom. Unfortunately, Dred Scott didn't get to enjoy his freedom for very long because he died of tuberculosis a year later, but at least his family were free and his court case was pivotal in accelerating the process that would ultimately lead to the freedom of all slaves in the United States. Incidentally, the Supreme Court's ruling in the Dred Scott case technically still stands to this day, having never been directly overturned by the Supreme Court since then. However, the 13th and 14th Amendments have effectively done the work of overruling the court's decision in that case. The 13th Amendment outlawed slavery, and the 14th Amendment, among other things, provides a citizenship clause which allowed people of any race to become citizens of the United States. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not subscribe to another channel I do called Biographics? I'm gonna link to that below and thank you for watching.